unit. It's a little different than a typical electromechanical and the dials were vertically mounted instead of horizontally mounted. And um, it has a little bit of a, a different design in that it, there's a little motor running with a disc that advances the, the lights versus the ratchet motor that you hear with the Econolite. Mm -hmm. The clicks. Yeah, instead of the clicks, this one's more of a whirring sound. Controllers were designed to regulate vehicular traffic and would also be given the task of protecting pedestrians crossing streets and throughways. Uh, the first pedestrian traffic signals came to be after World War II, um, mostly again in the larger cities. Uh, the pedestrian volumes were so high that they created their own phase for a lot of these pedestrians. Phase, by phase, I mean that they would have a sequence in the signal system where the, the traffic would be all red, so everybody would stop, and then the pedestrians would get their own walk signal. So the original pedestrian signals were part of the traffic signal, only just an added section at the bottom that had a walk display. So by pedestrians looking at the light, they would see the light would go red for the cars, and then they would get a walk, and they could basically move from whatever corner they wanted to to whatever corner uh, but later um, they the signals began to be separated out and then um, pedestrians had their own signals to follow another innovation was the pedestrian push button which when pushed told the controller that one or more pedestrians were present and alter the signals phase cycles accordingly the first push buttons i believe were in the 30s to early 40s um, basically the, before pedestrian signals were used, uh, the push button was there to uh, so that pedestrian could call a regular vehicle signal if they were trying to cross the street. If there were no vehicles around uh, on the cross street, they could at least uh, actuate the signal and be able to cross on the green light. So I believe the push button is a lot older than the actual pedestrian signal. It's important to note this system of actuated traffic control needed no human oversight and put citizens on an honor system. In the 100 plus years the system has been in place, it has proven to be one of civilization's great successes. Neon first appeared in France and was brought to Los Angeles by car dealer Earl C. Anthony, who saw the potential of adding more of his cars to the road using these brightly colored lights. The first neon sign was erected at 7th and Flower, in LA ground to a halt. Neon signs were erected at every major thoroughfare, usually in the line of sight of drivers at red lights. The signs became part of pop culture and conjured up images of smoke-filled bars, sax players, and leggy women in search of a good time. LA novelist Raymond Chandler once wrote, there ought to be a monument to the man who invented neon. The winds of World War II brought an end to the neon age when Mayor Fletcher Boron ordered all signs turned off so the enemy could not use them to target the city. After the war, some signs were relit, but many fell into neglect. The Los Angeles Raymond Chandler wrote of had become a memory. It remained that way until the 1990s when the city refurbished and relit many of the classic signs such as the one above the Broadway Hollywood. Many signs erected in the last century are now burning brightly in the 21st century. Neon lighting wasn't just limited to business signage, but also found its way into traffic control with Econolite's exposed to neon pedestrian signals. These signals are no longer used, but are much sought after by collectors. Although Raymond Chandler never got his monument to the creator of neon, there is a museum inclusive of neon traffic signals, among other things. Well, originally, it started as just a collection. I was just uh, interested in collecting signals, mostly of the Southern California style, styles that I remember that were slowly changing into other uh, types. So I wanted to preserve the, the historical uh, signals I remembered as a child here and growing up in Southern California. But then from there, it grew into um, collecting signals from all around the country because I had visited other parts of the country and um, another favorite place we like to go to in, in Iowa where grandmother lived, um, I was interested in those signals as well, the different styles and started noticing how the differences in them. From there it just grew into um, multiple different styles of signals and stuff and then when the internet came along um, it became, I thought of the idea of a virtual museum that people could come and, and start seeing that signals aren't all the same, that there is a difference. So, that's kind of how it grew from that. It was just an idea of coming up with a virtual museum. And from there, coming into maybe an actual museum that people could visit. This is the Wait Walk design. Wait Walk probably came out in the late 50s because it is Econolite. Econolite 
uh, took over production from GE in 1956, so this would have to be after that. But yet it's um, not too, you know, new or old um, in that it uses weight walk versus walk don't walk. Now let me ask you, how do you how do you keep these things working when they when they start to break down? And I remember when I used to see some of the signs, they'd start flickering and everything like that. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you take them just to a regular neon shine mm -hmm. shop? Or? Yeah, luckily I had a problem with one of my other ones that a sign had fallen on it and broke uh, one. I think it was the walk uh, tubing, and I was able to take it to a neon shop, and they were able to, to reproduce the color and the uh, the lettering. So I was glad to know that you can do that. Um, same with the transformers the weight on both of these had worn out because the indication had been on so long over the years that the transformer just wore out over time. And I was able to find uh, a transformer from a neon company with a similar output. And, and voila, it works great. The wait walk command gave way to the more familiar walk don't walk commands when traffic standards were revised. These signals are still widely remembered by Southern California natives. They were manufactured by Los Angeles-based Econolite Corporation. Yeah, yeah, and that's the exposed tube uh, neon walk, don't walk, uh, with the tubes basically suspended in space with the little attachment points there and creating the words walk and don't walk. Uh, the walk was behind the don't walk, so it would glow through the, uh, the orange or the clear tube when it's off, but it would turn orange when it's lit. So you'd have two, two types of neon in the walk indication and then a, the don't in its own place. Now, one of the most interesting things I find about these signals is, is whoever made these signals uh, must have been an English teacher because they bothered to put the apostrophe, <laughs> apostrophe. in there. Yep, you notice that. This is one of the only styles of signals that was able to use, that utilized the apostrophe and made it correct. Most of them eliminated that. Econolite observed all grammatical roles when designing these signals by adding the apostrophe in the word don't. Um, then come the 80s, they started getting phased out. Now, were these popular around the country? Because the only place I really know them being in wide use, of course, California. is California. Yeah, this particular style that I know of was only used in California. Krauss Heinz made a similar style, but the don't and walk were side by side. And those were used in um, Washington, D.C. and a couple of other places. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, basically a longer... A long sign. Yeah, it said don't walk. And uh, there's, a, I think, a picture on the club of it. Neon is light in a yeah. tube. All air is replaced by gases such as neon, argon, helium, or krypton. A sealed vacuum is created and a high voltage current of 2 to 15,000 volts causes these gases to emit light. This is the neon walk don't walk that uses a plastic legend in the front. Mm -hmm. Now, did those plastic legends, like most other things, become brittle over time yeah. and crack away? Yeah, eventually, with sun exposure and such, they can become brittle. As it is, this one hasn't, mm. hasn't been opened in a while. Little WD-40, you say? Yeah. There we go. Getting there. There we go. Come on. There we go. <laughs> now this, unlike the other uh, exposed to neons, don't have. They have. They have the uh, the appearance of the words that they're supposed to be, but except for the walk portion. But this looks like it's an insert. It looks like mm -hmm. it's an insert into what could have been another another type of signal. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some give us an idea about that? Yeah, I mean this. I think this one was made for this style actually, but uh, a lot of times they were modified um, with the the case being made for one type of signal head, and then as things became different and more efficient, they would you know basically gut it out and put new modules in their place. Uh, this one I think was for this style of signal. Uh, I can't. It won't let me do yeah. it with it on, but. Um, if you want, I can turn it off and we can look back there. Yeah, it's, it's like we can do that in a little bit. Sure. Sure. All right. I'll take it down. And that's it for our first look at the Museum of Traffic Control and a look at the history of motoring in the U.S. and Los Angeles in particular. We hope you've enjoyed it. And remember, these particular shows were derived from the Westlake Signal film, Life in the Fast Lane. If you want to know about that, get in touch with us here at Newswire LA and we'll tell you more.
In the meantime, to follow everything Newswire LA, look us up on Facebook and Twitter at Newswire LA. I'm your host, Chin Thomas Sangsi, saying good night, and we'll see you back here next week. Stay tuned for more news on this Westlake Signal Station.